Welcome everybody to session 4A, which has the title Asphalt Mixture Performance and Testing. My name is Knut Janssen and I'm the chairman of the APAS Technical Committee. It's my great honor to guide you through this session, which will take approximately one and a half hours. Please do use the possibility to ask whatever you want to know from the speakers. For this, you can utilize the chat box next to your video screen. In this respect, I have a wish. When you type in a question, please indicate who you want to ask. So for example, type in at Martins or question to Jerry. That will make things a little bit easier for me. But I guess you all experience social media users and know how this works. And you can also rate the questions having been posted by others. The more likes a question gets, the more likely it is we can address it in the Q&A. Yesterday, it turned out that there are often more questions in an online Q&A than in a live event, and we do have a very strict Spanish timetable to follow. So please use that functionality in order to help getting the relevant things up. Anyway, you will additionally be able to address the speakers afterwards via the conference message system in the networking launch, but we, of course, would appreciate having rich life discussions here with you. What can you expect from this session? Well, we'll be having two sections of three presentations each. After each section, there will be a Q&A of 10 minutes. In this session, speakers will be heard that work in four European countries and in the United States. So we will truly be international in the best sense of this Congress. The topics cover a significant range of asphalt performance and testing topics. It starts with recycling, a topic which has been there for quite a while. But I guess nowadays we are all well aware of the fact that there's a new relevance to this topic. At a time when CO2 has a price, recycling becomes incredibly important. The other topic that also benefits well from new regulations fighting the climate emergency is service life. Four of the presentations today deal directly or indirectly with the design life of a pavement, which will also be a major factor for any life cycle assessment. So let's start with the presentations. Martin Somanis will talk about trials with 100% recycling of asphalt mixes. Martins is probably one of the most viewed representatives of our asphalt topics in and outside of the branch. He operates his own YouTube channel with more than 200 subscribers, which is really worth watching. But his main profession is being a researcher at EMPA in Switzerland. His research focus is directed towards bringing sustainability to road pavements through recycling, warm mix asphalt, and the use of secondary raw materials in asphalt production. He's closely collaborating with road construction companies and road administrations to transfer these technologies into practice. Martins is also keen to unravel the hidden potential that scientists have for communicating their research. He has recently published a book on writing research papers and is additionally sharing his experience through blog. I'm very proud he's opening our session. So thank you for inviting uh, me for this conference. Uh, the Euro Bitum and Euro Asphalt Conference is one of my favorite events in the asphalt world. So I'm uh, very glad to be able to present here. So my, uh, my uh, research is on uh, um, production of uh, high modulus asphalt concrete entirely from recycled material. And the question is, why do we need this? Um, because uh, high modulus asphalt is sort of a premium product. And the reason is that uh, still in a lot of places, there are uh, large amounts of uh, reclaimed asphalt uh, available. And, and this is particularly pro a problem in locations where a lot of roads are already paved, for example, uh, large cities or um, uh, countries like Switzerland where basically all the roads are uh, covered in asphalt. So it's not possible to downcycle, uh, downgrade the reclaimed asphalt into lower layers uh, or, or base layers. So we have to find new ways and, uh, to, to use the material 
And I thought high modulus asphalt might be a good idea. Uh, for those who don't know, high modulus asphalt is a material, uh, an asphalt type where we use a hard grade of a binder or a polymer modified binder uh, in tandem with the higher binder content uh, to ensure that uh, the mixture is, uh, has a high modulus. It is uh, rot resistant and fatigue resistant. And this seems to be a relatively good fit uh, for uh, uh, using of uh, reclaimed asphalt pavement because the wrap binder is already aged and thus it provides the required hard grade binder. And the second reason is that uh, for high modules asphalt, uh, it is, we, we have to use performance based tests. And uh, we should also be aiming for this uh, when using high wrap mixtures because we cannot fully rely on the uh, established volumetric uh, relationships for. Uh, high wrap mixtures. So I thought, why not try this? Uh, and uh, there are three tests that, uh, uh, three performance tests that we have to use for, for high modules asphalt. Uh, one is uh, rutting and normally mixtures containing high wrap content are rut resistant. And the second is uh, that we have to ensure high modules. And then, like I said, the aged binder normally ensures this. And the third is uh, fatigue resistance. We need a high fatigue resistance. And uh, here, this might be a problem because um, the aged wrap binder, normally we, we associate it with the uh, lower fatigue life. So we started uh, the mixture design from this point, from trying to uh, optimize the fatigue uh, performance for the uh, recycled mixtures. The way we do it is using an indirect tensile test. And uh, basically, we measure the, uh, the modulus uh, at the beginning, and then we see at which point 50% uh, reduction is reached, and this is what we call the failure. And we try this with uh, several different strains, and uh, from that, basically, we can uh, then uh, plot such uh, graphs where at different strain rates we see um, what is the uh, fatigue life. So as you can see, I was quite dedicated to this experiment. Uh, fatigue uh, is a test that takes a long time. And I was trying, you know, you can count here, there are uh, nine different uh, mixtures. And I was designing them sort of uh, iteratively. So I, I started with one. Uh, yes, and, the, uh, and the, the result that we are mostly interested in, or, or the way that the results are expressed often is through epsilon six, uh, which is the strain at uh, 1 million cycles. Uh, so if you look in this uh, chart here, then uh, uh, this uh, column here represents the number. So basically I started with the, with the mix, which had a very low fatigue life. And then we did some optimization, uh, some changes in the mix design, then it improved. And uh, compared to this uh, red one is the uh, reference mixture. And we reached a level which is, you know, comparatively reasonably close to the re reference mixture. So just to show you one uh, result uh, fully. So this is uh, one of the mixes. Let, let's focus on this one. Um, and these below here are the three different uh, uh, performance tests that we have to do. So the middle one is the fatigue. Um, the result is 46 and, and the requirement is 50. So we haven't fully reached it, um, but it's reasonably close, you know, within 10% uh, difference. For modules, we are uh, above the, we fulfilled the requirement. And for the rutting, we are a little bit above the 5% uh, um, proportional rut, de rut depth uh, requirement. But again, this is not a huge difference. And moreover, we didn't fully uh, use uh, exactly the, the standard requirements. So there's reason to believe that actually this number is a little bit higher than it uh, should be if we would have followed the standard. So basically, um, the results are a little bit worse than we would want, but uh, it's in the same magnitude, you know. So perhaps uh, if we don't uh, want to put this kind of uh, material on a highway, this might be an option for uh, lower quality, ro uh, lower traffic intensity roads, but, uh, but still a way to uh, use the wrap. But before coming to such conclusions, and we wanted to really make sure if this is the case, and for that, we use the traffic load simulation. So we, this is kind of an upscaling of the lab results uh, by one level. Uh, this is still a, a lab test, but uh, a little bit closer to the actual field performance. And the way that the test works is it applies um, a moving load, an axial load uh, to a, a pavement slab. And the slab is uh, supported by two beams at the ends. 
uh, and the rubber mat in uh, in uh, below the slab and we have uh, uh, created a notch here in the middle so that every time the wheel passes and there would be some uh, displacement some uh, flexing of the of the slab and eventually a crack is going to appear here so the way we measure this uh, is with using LVDTs and with the digital image correlation and I'm going to quickly show the results now so these are the digital image uh, correlation, uh, sorry, these are the uh, LVDT results. And, and here, this is kind of an indirect way of uh, measuring the uh, crack propagation uh, because uh, what we measure is the deflection and, and these results are in the middle of the slab. So the deflection at the middle of the slab, the higher it is, the more we can think that this is related to, to cracking uh, because if, if uh, the crack propagates through the entire um, uh, slab height, then the two, uh, two uh, parts of the slab would start to move independently of each other and, and we would see a higher deflection. So the results, uh, the lower graph, the red uh, curve here is the um, reference mixture and we can see that it barely, the deflection has barely changed and the interruptions here, these are uh, simply the, the different dates when we were loading the sample. So we loaded it for five days and there was no uh, change in the deflection. For the wrap mixtures, uh, just two repetitions of the same mixture, we see a much higher deflection amplitude and we stopped the test after one day because the slab was already broken. And uh, an even better way to see this uh, was through the digital image correlation. Uh, the digital image correlation or DIC, uh, the way it works is that we spray some paint on the uh, around this uh, place where we expect a notch uh, to the crack to uh, propagate so that's around the notch and then the camera records the uh, distance between uh, between these uh, uh, small spots of paint paint and and if it sees that uh, the distance changes that's an indication of cracking so for the reference mixture we saw that even after 320,000 cycles there was no change uh, in the distance between the dots so basically the the uh, slab was intact well, for the wrap samples, uh, in both cases, both uh, slabs, both repetitions, and uh, the sample was broken already after 1000 cycles. So what we see here is that even though uh, in the lab, uh, we were able to design mixtures that were uh, sort of fatigue resistant and, and, uh, and we expected them to perform, if not as good as reference mixture, then uh, quite close to that. And what actually we see is that uh, <laughs> at least uh, they are 320 uh, times uh, worse <laughs> in this test. Uh, so a couple of lessons from this, uh, we have to consider which performance to use and if we can really trust them. So in this case, for the high module, we use the rutting test and the uh, fatigue test, uh, as well as uh, uh, modulus uh, testing. and. Uh, we saw that the results are reasonably close to the to what we would uh, want them to be, but uh, in this uh, uh, MMLS3 testing, we saw that uh, actually the results are way worse. Uh, so this is an indication that perhaps we were testing the wrong things, and definitely validating in a large scale is a good idea. And before we recommend to use such uh, mixtures in in the uh, full scale. Uh, another conclusion was that. Probably the reason that we were not able to design mixtures that would uh, be very uh, suitable for such applications is that the quality of the wrap was not as good as uh, it should have been. Uh, and uh, that's why I was not further able to optimize the, um, the mixture design. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to write me an email and you'll find uh, everything about this study and also other studies on my uh, website. Thank you. So oh, thank you very much indeed, Martins, for your enlightening presentation. So like you said, if you have questions to Martins, please don't hesitate to post them in the chat box. You can do so all the time, uh, just until the first Q&A starts, which will be in about 20 minutes. The next speaker will be Rabira Saba, who's working for the Norwegian Public Roads Administration as a senior principal engineer. He holds a PhD from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and is actually working on R&D topics in the field of structural design. The topic he presents is the first of two presentations about layer bonding. 
Both speakers approached the topic experimentally, with Rabira benefiting from a real application on the road. Please direct your attention to Rabira's presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is investigation of interlayer bond strengths using tensile and shear tests. First, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Venke Hoven, who is also working at uh, the Central Ma Materials Laboratory of the Norwegian Public Roads Administration. Uh, my presentation today concerns TACOT and interlayer bond or the bond strengths between the different layers, asphalt layers in the pavement structure. As many of you know, the bond between the various layers in a pavement structure is very important for pavement performance. However, uh, road agencies face challenges in terms of setting requirements for uh, TACOT application rate or the interlayer bond strengths. Logically, one would expect that both a low application rate and a high application rate would give poor bond between asphalt layers which means one would expect to find an optimum application rate which gives the highest bond strength between the asphalt layers. However, uh, this optimum application rate appears to be somewhat elusive because research has shown that the optimum depends on a number of things, including the test method. Uh, it might also be affected by the environmental conditioning, particularly temperature. And the research that we have done earlier in 2014-2015 showed that there is unclear relationship between the application rate and shear bond strengths. So this research or a result from the research that we have done have led us to raise a number of questions like can the shear bond strength testing test measure adhesive bond strengths, or is it just measuring the frictional resistance that arises at the interface from interlocking? Is the tensile test more appropriate? Are these test methods capable of uh, measuring effects of quality of emulsion, like differentiating between modified and unmodified emulsions? And what is the appropriate level of bond strength to use in setting requirements? So the, the paper I'm presenting today is an attempt to contribute to answering some of these questions, especially those related to test methods and quality of emulsions. What we did is we used two polymer modified emulsions, which I call PMBE1 and PMBE2, the PMBE1 is a latex uh, modified and PMBE2 is a SBS modified emulsion. So we laid uh, five test sections in the field, each about 30 meters long on two paving projects. And the first paving project, the top coat is applied on all existing asphalt surface, while on the, on the second project, it was applied on a milled surface. So what we did is we had three target application rates, uh, 0 0.07, 0 0.14, and 0.21 kilogram per square meter in terms of residual binder. And then we measured the actual apply, uh, applied rate. And as you can see in this table to the right, uh, we have uh, achieved quite close application rate to what we targeted. So after laying these uh, uh, test sections, uh, we took core specimens, about 100 millimeter in diameter, and these specimens were tested in shear bond and tensile bond strength testing in the laboratory. So the shear bond strength test is uh, conducted according to the proposed European standard 1269748 at 20 degrees centigrade. 
and uh, the at the loading rate of 50 millimeters per minute. The tensile bone strength is, is not standardized, but what we is what we did in the tensile bone test is we trimmed the edge the ends of these uh, core specimens to get a flat surface, and then these surfaces were glued to steel plates with the same diameter as the specimen. And these steel plates then are fastened to a testing equipment, which applies a tensile force at 200 Newton per second. So a, the tensile test is also conducted at 20 degrees centigrade. So here are some uh, of the results that we obtained, uh, which shows uh, bond strength against application rate, both the shear bond and tensile bond strength for the two uh, modified emulsions. We see that uh, the results for uh, PMBE1 is, are better than those of PMBE2. Uh, and uh, as you might remember, PMBE2 was applied on a milled surface, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, but we see that after testing, uh, we found that there are some uh, broken chips, stone particles at the interface in, for the PMB2 samples, which indicates that the cleaning after milling was not that good. So it's a poor workmanship here. So the difference that we see here might be because of this poor workmanship rather than the difference in materials. So this points to the fact that Cleaning the surface is very important in terms of uh, getting a good bond strength. We would expect that uh, milled surfaces would give better bond strength than old surfaces, but if it is not done properly, the opposite might be true, meaning that can be uh, poor strengths between the layers. So what also we did is we tried to find a correlation between the uh, top coat application rate and bond strength uh, for the two uh, modified emulsions. Uh, we see here on this graph to the left that uh, both for shear bond strength and tensile bond strength, there is no correlation between application rate and bond strength. But the data that we have here is quite limited. So we uh, added another data from earlier study in which we used unmodified emulsions and tested in shear bone strengths. But uh, the testing conditions were exactly the same. So we combined the data of the shear bone strengths testing from earlier study to this one in an attempt to see if there is any correlation as shown on this graph to the right. And we see still that there is no correlation. We also split the data into two for uh, depending on the type of surface, milled surface uh, as opposed to new asphalt surface. We see that still there is no correlation. So we conclude from this study that there is no correlation between application rate and shear bone strengths within the range of application rate that we have tested. It also appears that there is no correlation between tensile bone strengths and application rate. Also, the data here quite small. And also, we found out that on average, modified emulsions give higher shear bone strengths than unmodified emulsions. So that's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Rabira. Uh, we already received a lot of questions, so please use the chance to rate them so I know which one to ask first in the Q&A. Rabira told us about the different states of stress when testing for layer bonding and about the interpretation problems when comparing different tests for this. So this is a perfect transition to the next presentation, which will deal with a new testing method to describe the bonding behavior of asphalt layers. The presentation will be given by Professor Hervé Di Benedetto from ENTPE at the University of Lyon in France. His research activities focus on the study of 
thermomechanical behavior of geomaterials and structures, including experimental and modeling aspects. He's a well-known expert who chairs different international committees and associations. He supervised more than 60 PhDs and can look back on more than 200 publications. We are very excited to hear his presentation now. I'm going to present you a study about the thermomechanical behavior or interfaces between permanent layers made in bituminous mixtures. First, I would like to thank my co-author, Cédric Sozea, Simon Pouget, and especially Thomas Atia, uh, who obtained the result I will present during his PhD. This work could be done thanks to a cooperation between University of Lyon and NTP, my laboratory, and the FAGE infrastructure. Uh, it was within an industrial share that allowed uh, the defense of two theses in 2020. I'm going now to, to speak about the first thesis, a thesis from uh, Tomatia, and show you some results. As you know, the road structure is made with different layers that can be as a bituminous, made with bituminous mixtures, hydraulically bounded material and bounded material. And in between these layers, there are interfaces that can be made of techco, geogrid, or other. A better uh, bond interface uh, uh, knowledge uh, uh, behavior give a better structural uh, resistance then better knowledge of interface behavior allow to improve design method and allow to design sustainable structures, more sustainable. So the question is how to describe the bonding of the layers at the interface and more generally, not only the bonding, but also the rheological behavior. To answer this question, we developed an exper experimental device called 2T3C holo cylinder apparatus. ET3CHCA, who is as far, which is as far as we know, the first holo cylinder apparatus for interface characterization. It was developed at the NTPE, the University of Lyon, in our laboratory. It allows to apply tension and tension compression on holo cylinders with two layers. It's an homogeneous test, which makes easy the rheological interpretation. And uh, we can apply with this device complex loading pace, such as cyclic or monotonic, in shear and or normal, applying shear and or normal stress. You here have a view of the specimen that can be cored directly in the road structure or cored on slab made in the laboratory. This specimen has two layers, as indicated here, an upper layer and a lower layer. And in between the two layers, of course, there is the interface. The dimension of the specimen is given here. It's 12.5 centimeter, external diameter 17.2, internal diameter 12.2, which gives a thickness of the wall of 2.5 centimeters. Here you have a view, a general view of the device. So the sample is in the middle here. It, it is within a, a, a press uh, inside a thermal chamber here. So you have uh, some sensors that gives you the displacement between the uh, two platterns on which are glued the specimen and load cells of the press that give the axial force and the torque. So one of the key originality of this device is uh, present the use of uh, four cameras, two on each side that aim at the surface of the sample and allow by uh, digital image correlation uh, analysis to obtain the uh, displacement field at the surface of the sample in three dimensions. More in detail here, you have a view of the sample in a white here and the window, which is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, which is aimed by the uh, camera, which is targeted by the camera and that allow to obtain the displacement field. I will show you an example of, an example of a test performed at 20 degrees C, 0.3 air, it's 
sinusoidal loading with a global vertical amplitude at the boundary of the sample of 25 microns, which gives a 200 micro strain displacement. You have the sample here and the loading indicated here. And you can see that we obtain with a specific analysis method, the strain field as a strain in the layers and the displacement gap at the interface. You can see here the type of image we obtain with uh, contraction here, tension, contraction, and tension. And for example, if we if I if I look at the image at the maximum contraction level, we can obtain the displacement at different eight of the sample, the displacement in the axial direction because it's an axial loading. So you have the data here, which are the, 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 the plot, the point. And if you, 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 you put a line uh, joining this, uh, this, this data, this point, then the slope of this uh, line gives you the strain in the upper layer here and the strain, axial strain in the lower layer here. When you extrapolate the line, you have the value of the gap at the interface, delta uz here, which uh, uh, the, 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 inter the gap we obtain experimentally is between 0.5 and 3 micron, which gives you the great accuracy of the device. And this accuracy is needed to have a correct uh, value. So now some experimental uh, results. So, so first experimental procedure, I will show you a result uh, from a, a, a specimen made with an upper layer of BB5, which is a mixture developed by FH company, and the lower layer ME, which is a high French uh, modulus mixtures. And in between, there is a tack coat made with pure bitumen emulsion. Those are 350 gram per, per square meter. We, I will show you the result for six, three samples, and G6, G6, M6, and D6. First, some result in the small strain behavior. In fact, it's an advanced complex modulus test. First, uh, axial loading with no torque is applied at four frequency and four temperatures. Then, only shear with no axial stress is applied at the same frequency. The global strain, the maximum strain amplitude for both tests are 200 micro, uh, micro deformation. Then I will show you a result of that strain behavior, a monotonic shear failure, failure test at constant rotational rate with constant normal stress. The normal stress supply is 0 0.25 and 1 megapascal. Here is a result for a small in the small strain domain. Uh, the y-axis is uh, is uh, uh, stiffness of the interface, interface stiffness, which is the ratio between the gap at the interface divided by the stress, either uh, axial stress or she stress K theta Z. Uh, this result are plotted, uh, uh, X is the equivalent frequency. So you see here the results for the three test. The, the curves are, are quite well superimposed, which uh, shows that the, there is a very good uh, repeatability of the test. We could uh, model the result using the 2S2P model developed in our laboratory. 2S2P1D means two, two spring, two parabolic creep element, and one dash pot. And the interesting result is that the, the this model could be uh, uh, calibrated using cis constant on lines that are coming from the bitumen. Now some results about uh, large strain failure. So the first result, this is a uh, horizontal gap displacement uh, interface, shear stress as a function of horizontal uh, displacement gap at the interface, uh, zero megapascal as uh, axial stress, 0.25 and one megapascal. The higher normal stress, higher interface shear strength, and higher normal stress, higher displacement at As a conclusion, as a conclusion, I show you an innovative uh, experimental device 
developed at the University of Lyon in Tepeu. As far as we know, it's the first low cylinder apparatus to study interface. It's a, we use 3D digital image correlation to obtain uh, the displacement gap at the interface with a very good uh, accuracy. And this accuracy is really needed to uh, model correctly the interface behavior. In the small thread behavior, so we, we show that the time temperature superposition was very fine and the uh, interface could be modeled using 2 s 2 p one d And we also have uh, some uh, results at failure. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested by the study, you can download the Thomas Atias PhDs, which is in English. It's free. You have the address here. You can also consult the two uh, publications, two, two papers indicated here. I would be pleased now, thank you, to answer your question. Thank you. Terry, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to welcome all the speakers from our first three presentations who have hopefully joined me now. Please, all of you, unmute your microphones and uh, maybe say hello to everybody. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay, we will start right away um, as we only have 10 minutes time for the Q&A. Um, I would like to start with Rabira as uh, Martin says, the most questions at the moment. So Rabira, um, what does the specification in Norway say about the amount of tech code? I think you used something like 100 to 300 in your research. Um, what is the specification in Norway for that? Uh, yeah, the specification, uh, the one we have now, uh, which was uh, uh, developed a couple of years ago, uh, uh, it depends on the type of surface. For uh, dense surfaces, it ranges between 0.1 to, to 0.2 uh, kilograms per square meter. Uh, so for uh, milled surfaces, it can go up to 0.3 uh, 0.3 kilograms per square meter. So that's a recommendation. Uh, in addition to, uh, to that, we have a, a requirement now that uh, shear bond strength should be at least 0.7 megapascals. Uh, so that's what we have uh, currently. Uh, thank you very much. That, that already answers the second question. I think would you recommend to make visual inspection of the emulsion amount to take macro texture into account which is definitely the, the, the case in Norway then. So you're, you're looking at the macro texture to adapt the amount of imaging. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. I would like to switch over to Martins. Uh, Martins, we've received a lot of questions and the one rated uh, at the top is at the moment from Tine Tange. She asked, was the rep coming from different stockpiles or locations and or was the rep fractionated in different fractions for all mixed designs? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it was coming from a single stockpile. All of the rep that we used uh, was exactly the same. Uh, at the production facility, it was uh, fractionated into 011 fraction and 1122. So I was able to sort of uh, change the proportions of these two. Um, Later, when I saw that uh, the mixed designs are not as good as I was hoping for, I also decided to further split the 0 011 fraction into two. So I, I had the 0 5.6 and 5.6 11. And then I was kind of playing with the three different uh, wrap fractions. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another question regarding the type of um, fatigue test, Martins. Could you please provide some details regarding your fatigue tests? And why did you choose this test and not, for instance, a two-point bending test? Which test method would you recommend according to your expertise? The, the question comes from Nicolas Buch. Yeah. Um. The parameters, we used uh, 10 degrees Celsius and uh, 10 Hertz. Uh, so it was a cyclic uh, indirect tensile test. Uh, as I said, uh, all the details are in the paper in, in case you uh, want to refer to them. Uh, the strain for the samples was between 0 0.05 promils and, and one always. And we were aiming for three different uh, 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 
uh, cycle durations for, for the sample. So between uh, 10,000 and 1 million cycles uh, until the failure of the samples. Uh, the reason to choose uh, this particular test method is more or less pragmatic. This is what we have in our lab. I am aware that this is probably not the best fatigue test out there, and there are some problems uh, with it, but uh, I don't have that much experience. I, I think uh, if anyone, uh, Harvey, in our uh, discussion should have the most uh, expertise on that and uh, can comment better than I do. Erin, would you like to answer that? Oh. We are speaking about the test to, to describe fatigue. It's a... Uh... An incredible complex topic I am studying since many years. <laughs> I cannot answer in two minutes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. But what I do think and what I showed in many publications is that the classical uh, test considered as fatigue has nothing to deal uh, with uh, with uh, uh, modeling of fatigue or with uh, the, the, the simulation of fatigue. But it's a big debate. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a, sometimes a little bit of a political topic. Um, yes, 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 it's becoming political. Okay, Abby, now that we arrived at you, um, there's a question to you. What are the advantages of using hollow samples instead of cores? How to make sure that samples are not destroyed due to coring actually two times? So you make two. Yes, in fact, we could obtain the, the, the sample by coring twice without problem. In fact, it's only using uh, two uh, twice the process of coring. But why using? It's, it's very simple because if you want to have a correct information on the uh, behavior, you must be sure that the strain or stress is the same or nearly the same along the radius. And if you have a full uh, cylinder, the shear strain at the center is zero and it is maximum at the external. So when you have such sample, you are not able to obtain uh, correctly uh, rheological information from the test. This is why we use hollow cylinder. Of course, hollow cylinder were used in the past, but in the specific case of study of interface, I don't think it was. It was, for example, used, uh, I know, uh, in Berkeley and uh, Professor Moni Smith and uh, also at AMPA a long time ago. It's, it's also a test that is uh, used on soils in, in geomaterials. Thanks. So I would like to ask one more question, one last question to you, Elie, because it just came up here. It was the last question, and it, it refers to something we had yesterday in a presentation by Gustavo. Um, he also talked about a testing method for, for shear bond, uh, for bond testing. And now the question is, um, is shear deformation appearing in the gap between the two layers or in the body of the layer? Uh, this is also an interesting question because there is a, al, always what we what we call a, a limit layer. But from what we measure, so we have a, uh, we have a data every uh, one or two many millimeters in the in the eighth of the sample from the from the the uh, data I showed. You see that in the layers. The displacement is linear. If in the layer, the displacement measured by the camera is linear, it means that the strain is constant. And this is what we obtain. And uh, I can add something that there was a, 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 a cross-ref uh, uh, experiment trying to uh, characterize the interface behavior that was launched without uh, a RILEM technical committee, uh, PIM, and different tests were used, such as the bayonet test of the, uh, and, and other tests to, uh, to access the layer uh, properties. And we obtained a, a very different results following the kind of test. And the ratio between the stiffness of 10 can be up to 100 if you don't take care 
of uh, only considering a very, very small layer at the interface. And this is, in fact, what you must have. Thanks to every one of you so far. Um, we're a little bit short of time. Uh, you can, of course, go on asking the three of them um, by using the, the message system. So, but before you go there, please keep an eye on our next three speakers. Um, the first one will be Kurs Joel. He studied road and railway engineering at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands and uh, started his career at Heimans in 2014. One of his major fields of work there with all aspects of rep management. So he really has a vast experience in real life production. Since the beginning of this year, he works in research and development at Asphalt New, a recently founded Dutch joint venture for asphalt production. In his paper, about which he will tell us in the next 10 minutes, he talks about the reuse of polymer modified binder in porous asphalts. Please go start with your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kojo. And together with my colleagues of Asphalt Nu and Heimans, two contractors, the Dutch Ministry of Public Works and TNO, a research institute, we did some research to the uh, recycling of polymer modified asphalt. And I'd like to introduce you in this subject. So as we all know, there's some circularity and recycling trends we have to face nowadays. And uh, one has to do with the climate, the other with the use of primary resources and i think the industry is partly or partly responsible there for this i think we also already made good progress in the recycling of base layers but for surface layers uh, we don't do it uh, as much as we can and it's a pity because those layers they contain high quality materials high quality aggregates high quality binder uh, sometimes modified uh, and nowadays we do nothing with them, we do just downcycle it. And we have to do more horizontal recycling. And it has, that, that means we have to face challenge uh, with dirt, with grading, H bitumen. And the second one, if the second challenge, if the bitumen contains PMB, uh, we also have to make sure the old and the new PMB, they blend well together. So how can we achieve that? Let's start with the resources. Uh, it's just, it's not only resource extraction, it's not removing asphalt, we do urban mining. And this urban mining, it requires effort, a lot of effort. Uh, you can see it here on the figures. And you can see this effort, it's more or less a boundary condition to, re to use recycling surface layers in general. But then the most important problem we have to face is the aged bitumen. From the surface layers, the H bitumen is very, very hard. Uh, penetration values of around 10, they're very common. And with the currently existing recycling met methods, it's not possible to reactivate this bitumen. So we have to do something different. And we developed a specific, specific process. We call it the soaking process. And it involves a rejuvenator, it involves time, and it involves temperature. And nowadays we have more or less, more than 10 years experience with this process. In this process, uh, with this process, we can achieve a good blending of the old and the new bitumen. Uh, so in a mixed design, uh, to, to uh, make sure we have the right dose of all the, all the binder materials, we started with the log pen value. Uh, but for a PMB, the pen value is not the only indicator. Uh, so we also did some practical tests regarding the workability, which finally led to the penetration value of 60, you can see in this table. So after the mix design, after the type test procedure, we did some intensive testing on this material. And the first, one of the first tests we did was the AirSat, the rotating surface abrasion test. It's a reveling test developed in the Netherlands. Uh, also investigated by Seder in the DRAT project. And uh, in, in general, it's a rubber wheel which slides back and forth over a rotating asphalt surface. And this movement uh, leads to torsion in the material. So we can, uh, we can see what the reveling resistance of the material will be. And we have 
about 20 years of experience with this test. And we see a very good correlation between the test and the practical service life. Uh, it's also used as a test by the Dutch Ministry of, uh, of Public Works uh, for the validation of new service layers. As you can see in the table, uh, that uh, the reference mixture and the mixture with reclaimed asphalt, they behave the same, more or less. Another intensive test was the frost toll research. And it's a really, really intensive test. It requires 42 days of preconditioning in water, afterwards 48 days with thermal load cycle cycles. So total lead time of more than three months of preconditioning. And then the samples are uh, used in the, in the indirect tensile test. And by comparing them with the unconditioned samples, we can see what the frost toll cycles did to the material. And we see that the results are more or less the same between the reference material and uh, the material with reclaimed asphalt in it. And we see this uh, more, we see them, don't see this only in this mixture, but in also in all other recycling mixtures that they have the same or better results than the reference material. And we expect that it is because the old binder already has a good adhesion to the stone and therefore frost damage doesn't do a, doesn't play a significant role anymore. Another intensive test we did had to do with the bitumen shell. We applied the peeling procedure. Uh, in brief, uh, we had a mixture. We extract this mixture and by tapping the extract from every minute and testing all those extracts one by one, we can tell something about the bitumen layer over the, the homogeneity of the bitumen over the thickness of the layer. Because the first extract is from the outer layer and the last extract is from the inner layer of the bitumen. And uh, we did some tests on that material. The first test is the GPC analysis. It tells us something about the molecular size of the bitumen. And uh, we can see two, uh, two things in this graph. First, the reference and the uh, new material, they behave more or less the same, the same molecular size, but more important uh, from the uh, outside of the layer to the inner side of the layer, the molecular size is very homogeneous. And that's what we want to see because it means that the, the product has blended very well. Other test we did was the uh, f tier anal analysis, the fingerprint. And you can see here the blue line is the aged BMB from the reclaimed asphalt. Uh, the red arrows, uh, they, they tell something about the aging peaks. And the other lines you see are the five peeling steps we applied and the fresh bitumen. We see that the, the, the blended product goes more towards new fresh bitumen. The blue peaks show us that the, the SBS material is still, uh, still there in the reclaimed asphalt. So we can reuse that SBS again in the new product. Then we also did uh, research to the functionality of the composite product. And here you can see a master curve uh, of the bitumen. Uh, the red line shows us the, the bitumen from the aged uh, material. And the orange line is the bitumen from the aged material plus the rejuvenator. And the blue line, the aged bitumen, the rejuvenator, and the new bitumen. And finally, the green line is only fresh bitumen. You can see orange, blue, and green are almost on the same place. Now, what does it tell us? What does this tell us? It tells that the initial conditions of the bitumen are right. They perform the same. What's more, what, 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 more, what is more important it is the aging procedure, the aging sensitivity of the material. Because we want to recycle this product over and over and over again. And therefore, we, we researched the aging sensitivity. We did that with the Ertifot and the Puff. Here you can see again the red line, the old bitumen, the blue line, the blended product, and the green line, the fresh bitumen. And we aged the blended product and the new bitumen. 
you can see that in the respective blue and green line. And we can see that the bladder product, it has an equivalent behavior. It doesn't age as fast as the new bitumen, even. The hypothesis of this is that the old PMB is less aging sensitive because it already experienced some aging during the previous surface life. Uh, but more, most important is that the behavior is equivalent. So we can recycle this product over and over again. So finally, some practical performance. Uh, when we did this research, uh, we also did a test section. It was near Amsterdam uh, and the experience was, uh, was very well. So we applied in 2016 around two kilometers of road with this product. And afterwards, since 2016, we already applied 50 kilometers of road of this product. And until now, we didn't have had any problems regarding this mixture. So I think for the future, we can use this product over and over again. And uh, it performs very well. So this was it about the recycling of polymer modified asphalt. I'm looking forward to your questions about this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Kos. Um, if you look around, uh, you will see that we already have 230 people here in the room, so it's getting warm in here. So the next presenter is Jerry Huber, who was one of the inventors of the famous American super pave mixed design method. Having started his career in Canada, he's now working in the United States. For the last 28 years, he has worked with the Heritage Research Group, the research arm of a group of companies in the asphalt industry. And Jerry will report about an adaption to the very method which he had bringing into life. Please, Jerry, the floor is yours. My name is Jerry Huber, and the title of my talk today is Super Pay 5, Enhanced Durability by Changes in Design and Construction. And my co-authors are Bill Pine with the Heritage Group, Matt Mason with the Indiana Department of Transportation, and John Haddock of Purdue University. During the 1980s in North America, a major concern was rutting. This ultimately led to the development of the Strategic Highway Research Program and the development of the SuperPave mixed design method. Generally, if we look at pavement performance in North America today, we would find that the issue is not rutting and an issue that happens is cracking. Now, this is an extreme example that I show here, but the question remains, how can we improve the performance in cracking? And that's what motivated this research into SuperPave 5. Now, let me offer to you uh, a demonstration in the field of the effect of in-place air voids on the cracking performance of pavements. So there is an area there just uh, past that transverse joint at which there are high air voids, which can be uh, detected or known by the permeability, by the, the wetness of, of the road. And I took a photograph that is just a couple of meters past that joint. And you can see that, that the moistness of the road disappears into, into the distance, that the, the permeability becomes less as, as we move forward in this picture. Now there is a crack that has formed along the wheel path there. And let me remove the highlighting of that crack so that you can see it better. And you will see that that, that crack disappears and so from where we are located to um, perhaps 10, 15 meters into the distance, the crack has disappeared. I would make the argument to you that the difference between these two locations is in place air voids, that the properties of the mixture, that is gradation, bitumen content, et cetera, are the same in both locations. The difference is compaction and hence the amount of in-place air voids. Now, if we look at the, the uh, mixed design, 
and the relationship of air voids in mixed design in North America, Marshall mixed design was done at a standard 4% uh, air voids and compaction specifications were nominally to leave about 8% air voids in place on the road with the idea being that at the end of life, the voids would be reduced after compaction by traffic to 4%. When SuperPave was developed in the 1990s, this concept was carried directly forward. This was a conscious decision to make the SuperPave mix design similar in concept to the Marshall mix design. Now, the French in the 1970s developed the LCPC method of mixed design. And although there is a range of design air voids, often designers will design at 5% air voids. Compaction specifications require 5% in-place air voids. And evidence shows that there is no post-compaction that is happening uh, under the effect of traffic and hence the voids stay at 5%. So in 2000, there was an NCHRP study that was done to look at the densification of pavements in North America. And 40 locations were selected around the US for different environmental zones and different traffic levels. And this is the distribution of the in-place density expressed as percent of theoretical maximum density. And we see that 8% air voids, that is 92% GMM, that fully 55% of the pavements had densities less than that, meaning that 55% of the pavements had air voids that were higher than the 8% that had been typically targeted. Now, if we look at the 50th percentile and we follow this forward with time, there you can see that the, uh, the dark black line is the as constructed and the 50th percentile air void content is 8.2%. The voids, the, uh, were, the cores were taken at three months, six months, one year and two years. And we can see that in the wheel path that after two years, the voids have decreased at the 50th percentile level to 5.4%. Now recognize that this is in the wheel path as compared to the remainder of the area of the lane, most of which receives significantly less loading and hence significantly less change in densification. So, the concept of SuperPay 5 is to design a mixture such that uh, it is, when it's designed at 5%, that it can be constructed to 5% so that the entire area of the lane then is constructed to 5%. So the objective The objective of the SuperPay 5 research was to adjust the mixed design gradations to allow compaction on the road with the same compactive effort, the number of passes, the, the rollers that are used, et cetera, and to maintain the same bitumen content as for SuperPay 4. The result of this research is that the mixed design compaction ended up being 30 gyrations. The air voids, 5%. The voids in the mineral aggregate are increased 1% as compared to the normal superpave. And the voids filled with bitumen are adjusted to 60 to 70%. Those trial projects were built after the research that was done at Purdue University and these trial projects, one of them is, the first of them is in the northern part of the state of Indiana. The second one is in the center of the state. And the third one is on the eastern side of the state. Now the results of these three show that compaction of approximately 95%, that is 
uh, 5% air voids was achieved in all three cases as compared to on the regular super pave was, was typically in the order of seven to 8%, which is typical of the air void content of mixtures that are built in super paved mixtures that are built in Indiana. So the trial sections indicated that it was that it was achievable to achieve 95% density, 5% air voids. So trial project number one in the northern part of the state was constructed in 2013. Cores were taken in 2018 and they, the cores were taken between the wheel path at three locations in the Super Pave 5, three locations in the Super Pave 4. If we look at the bitumen grade, the average bitumen grade for Super Pave 4 was PG100 minus 16, as compared to PG94 minus 21 for the Super Pave 5. If we look at permeability in, in each of these locations for each of the cores that, that were taken, we can see that there is uh, one of the locations of the Super Pay 5 had higher than average air voids of around six, and one of the locations of the Super Pay 4 had lower than average air voids, again, around six to seven. And that's important when we look at the PG grading of the bitumen uh, that is uh, recovered from each of the different locations, we can see that overlap in the Super Pay 4 and Super Pay 5 at around 6% air voids. And uh, we, we see that, that, the, that the difference in PG grade is not related to the fact that it is Super Pay 4 or Super Pay 5 but indeed is related to the in-place air void content. The relationship, the R squared of the high temperature PG grade is an R squared of more than 0.9 for the high temperature grade. For the low temperature grade, it is almost 0.9. So there's a very good correlation between bitumen aging and in-place air voids and of course, in-place air voids are very closely aligned to in-place permeability. Now, what about performance? So these projects, this project had low temperature cracking in it and the rehabilitation that was done in 2013 uh, had reflective cracking that came through. I have highlighted that with the green lines. Now, what you will see on the SuperPay 4 side on the left side of the screen is an, uh, a large amount of environmental cracking that is taking place as compared to on the super pay five side where there is very little and in this case almost none a uh, no environmental cracking so there is a distinct difference between the cracking performance of the super pay four and the super pay five mixture I'm not presenting the other two trial locations here, but in, in those, there is uh, similar differences in performance. So to summarize the findings, SuperPave 5 can be designed with 30 gyrations. Permeability is related to in-place air voids. After five years, SuperPave five mixtures aged less and cracked less because of the lower permeability. In 2018, the Indiana Department of Transportation made the decision to adopt SuperPay 5 and let some trial projects. In 2019, contractors were allowed the option of changing SuperPay 4 on previous contracts to SuperPay 5 and as well as constructing some trial projects such that about one half of the mixtures that were produced in 2019 were super pay five. In 2020, last year, almost all of the mixtures were super pay five. So what we seek is good performance 
not only in cracking, but also in rutting. And here you can see a picture of a reconstructed pavement that I took at age 13. And you can see the good performance. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you today. Yes, I would like to thank you back, Jerry, who joined us uh, early in the morning in the US. Um, we're now approaching the last speaker of this session. Uh, Wim van der Goes is the director of Lambda Furtherance, a company situated in the Netherlands, where he's responsible for sales and marketing of technical acrylic fibers. He studied biology at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, but judging from his excellent paper, he also has in-depth knowledge of asteroid concepts. He wants to develop his international business on the base of science and conscience, which surely is a good way. He will talk about the use of special fibers within porous asteroid mixes. And with this, I hand over the microphone to Wim. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Wim van der Goes. I'm director at Lambda Furtherance. I do this presentation together with Jan Voskuilen of Green Asphalt. The title of my presentation is Longer Lifespan of Porous Asphalt Due to the Addition of Homopolymer High Tenacity Polyacrylonitril Fibers. You see here um, the, the fibers in an electron microscope uh, graph. You see an exceptional uh, tiny fiber, a very thin fiber, uh, the thinnest acrylonitrile fiber there is with a 10 micron, uh, 10 micron diameter. You see also a very good slide underneath of a cross section in a mortar where the fibers are randomly dispersed throughout the bitumen. Uh, in Netherlands, since 2007, we apply two layer porous asphalt because of noise reduction properties, but also a lot of uh, good uh, advantages like drainage capacity, water storage, resistant to permanent deformation in rutting, and a good quality of runoff water. A standard two-layer porous asphalt consists of a top layer 25 millimeter porous asphalt 8 with PMB, polymer modified bitumen, and 20% voids. And a bottom layer of normal grade bitumen 7100 and 25% voids, PA-16, which is 45 millimeter. Well, as we done this since 2007, we have noticed that the average lifespan of top layer porous asphalt 8 on the slow lane is nine years, whereas on the fast lane, where there's a little bit less uh, heavy traffic, there's 12 years. Um, the maintenance strategy in Holland is Porous asphalt eight on slow lane is replaced after nine years, whereas the other one is replaced after 12 years. The goal of the project is to extend the lifetime of the porous asphalt. This was uh, conceived uh, not because of the Paris Accords, but to have some economic and ecological advantages way before. Uh, do we have a longer lifespan than uh, using PMB by adding pan fibers to the pen grade 7100 pen grade bitumen? We have investigated since 2005 uh, some tracks, and this is one of the few studies which have been done in a 16 years lifespan where we notice, con contrary to the initial lab results, that we do have indeed very nice results. It's not a matrix study. It's not a study with a lot of different fibers. It's not a study with a lot of different dosages. 
but uh, we we think this is a particular nice study because uh, 16 years of um, background is not uh, often seen. We also wanted to try in lab which mechanisms take care of uh, the longer lifespan of this porous asphalt. Well, here you, you see some technical characteristics of this uh, pan fiber. We only noticed that it has a very good resistance against chemical and physical forces and uh, rut, uh, weathering such as biological attack. It's one of the very few synthetic fibers which have a virtually uh, eternal life. We noticed out of uh, 14 years uh, or 16 years study that we see the lifetime, lifespan extension of four different sites, a uh, five year longer lifetime than the nine years, which is currently uh, standard in the slow lane. In the fast lane, we've seen also a five year uh, longer lifetime than uh, using polymer modified bitumen. We calculate that averagely uh, we have a four year longer lifetime uh, by using palm fibers with normal bitumen confronted with uh, polymer modified bitumen. Now, how do these fibers act? Um, we noticed by looking at micros, uh, microscope inspection that the bitumen cover of the stones of the aggregate is often degraded in polymer modified bitumen. So it doesn't really protect after a long period of oxidation of weathering on uh, force exposure. Instead, with the pan fibers, we see the bitumen uh, with a very smooth surface. It's kind of protection against um, influence of the life of the oxygenation of the bitumen. And we noticed that uh, this might be uh, the case when uh, we know we, we see a lifetime extension, that this, uh, this is the mechanism. So it, it's not a reinforcement, but it's a reinforcement against aging. Let me say that aging happens whatsoever, but the, the fibers offer protection against aging. Well, here we see the DSR tests, the master curves of fibers with uh, bitumen with fibers as compared to polymer modified bitumen. We see here uh, a much greater fatigue resistance of a bitumen, classical bitumen with pan fibers than polymer modified bitumen. All these tests have been done with mortars with, with an extended lifetime. Material costs. Uh, what we can say is that by using polymer modified bitumen, we have 10 to 15% gross cost of porous asphalt than using pen grade bitumen and pan fibers, but also higher production temperature net necessary to use polymer modified bitumen compared to pan fibers and uh, a longer lifetime of the coating. We did uh, environmental impact calculation uh, by an agency in TNO, an independent agency. And we noticed that uh, by extending the lifetime, considering all the pluses and minus of using the fibers, uh, we have an uh, environmental impact of 30% less. Conclusions. 
Spun fibers offer a four years longer lifetime of porous asphalt. We have a lower material and production cost. We have no problems with uh, recycling in the future as compared to polymers. And the environment in, environmental impact is 30% less. Now, there have been gaps in this study, but uh, it's worth to mention that this is one of the few studies which uh, have empirical data of a 16 years period. So it's worth a re uh, remarkable result that um, offers a lot of potential gains uh, for the environmental questions where we are all embedded in. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is it. Shoot any questions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Wim, for your excellent presentation. I'm hopefully joined now again by all the speakers of this session. Uh, for this Q&A course, we'll additionally be joined by his colleague, Herbert Bochofer. Um, please, all of you, unmute your microphones and say hello to everybody. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hi. Okay. Thanks. I see you all there. Okay, we're starting with calls. Calls. There uh, are questions about the soaking. Calls. Have you compared the impact of the soaking process? versus a uh, normal spraying of the material to the properties of the recycled asphalt binder? Um, well, for uh, the, the viscosity of the uh, rejuvenator we used uh, is that low, that we uh, don't want contact with the flame. So, uh, because we, we don't want to burn the rejuvenator. So therefore, the soaking process was used. Uh, we uh, put it in at the end of the parallel, dr parallel drum. And uh, we also didn't want to do it in the end mixer, in the end mixing phase, uh, because we found uh, that uh, then there isn't enough time to, um, uh, to work in on the, re on the aged PMB. I think you very well described that also in your paper, yeah. Um, Actually, I can uh, add a little uh, point. Uh, the advantages of the soaking process is that it is embedded in the existing plant. So there is no uh, essential uh, uh, things uh, necessary to add to the plant, only the, the rejuvenator adding, of course. So you can add it in the existing plant, and that's not a very big advantage, of course. Uh, and the second question um, is, have you assessed the polymer activity of the aged PMB rheologically, so fence angle, master curve, or black space, or something like that. Uh, yes, we we did uh, we did uh, uh, DSR uh, uh, experiments, and we had uh, black diagrams uh, which showed the, the PMB is uh, active in the product, uh, but the paper doesn't refer uh, very much to that. Okay, thanks. Um, I would like to, to go over to Jerry. Jerry, um, there are two questions about the variations, the number of 30, which you gave us, um, where the question is, don't they depend on the asphalt mix type or can you use them for different types of pavements? So the answer to the question would be that uh, this is all dense graded mixtures, uh, dense graded asphalt. And for different sizes of dense graded asphalt, uh, 30 ended up being the, the result of the research. The thing that I would point to is that the, the, the properties of the mixture in place on the roadway are dependent uh, for a given set of material properties, that is the properties of the aggregates, the properties of the bitumen, that they, uh, the relationship between the uh, design compactive effort uh, and the construction compactive effort together will relate to the 
engineering properties of the mixture in place on the roadway. And that's the way that the research approached it, trying to normalize the engineering properties of the super, regular super pave uh, mixtures as constructed and match that with the super pave five. So mm -hmm. the, the short answer to the story is that 30 gyrations uh, would be appropriate for all different sizes of dense graded mixtures. That's another question regarding the cracks you showed us on your slide. And uh, it says that these environmental cracks, how you call them, um, are these top-down cracks as opposed to the more commonly considered bottom-up fatigue cracks? And the question is, are top-down cracks becoming more of a concern in America? Uh, I think the answer, to both, the answer to both of those questions is yes. So first of all, it is top-down cracking that, that you were seeing in that. And, and it, was, it was driven uh, not by traffic, but by the, the environment. Now, the one thing that I did not point out in the presentation that I would add to it is that the, that particular project ended up having a very high percentage of bitumen coming from post-consumer asphalt shingles that are used on the roofs of houses in uh, uh, North America. And uh, that was back in 2013 that had 20% bitumen replacement with the shingle bitumen, which was now considered excessive and not allowed in specifications. What it did do is it created a very rapid deterioration from the point of view of environmental cracking. And that's why you see uh, uh, so much of it. Now, having said that, it, it's, it's very interesting to note that the, the higher in-place density, the lower permeability, even with that poor quality bitumen, provided reasonable performance. Now, coming back to the second part of the question, is there, is there more uh, attention being paid to environmental cracking in, in the US? I would say that the answer is yes, all cracking is, is a particular interest right now in the industry and amongst the agencies, but environmental cracking is certainly part of that. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, okay, let's go to Vim. Vim, there are a lot of questions for you. Um, I, I would like to start with the easiest one, which was, uh, I think, asked twice. Why do longer fibers work less well? Oh, this has to do with the classical issue of fiber meets diameter of the maximum uh, aggregate you have. So this top layer of uh, two layer porous asphalt in Holland is, uh, I believe two to eight average four millimeter. So three millimeter serves better initially we were coming from use of this fiber in porous asphalt 16, which is a, a, a larger diameter aggregate. And we thought to copy that result into this tinier uh, diameter two layer porous asphalt. However, we found out after some testing that the three millimeter works better. So, uh, we made two test stretches, one with six millimeter with PMB and one with a classical bitumen with a three millimeter. And uh, to our surprise, the three millimeter worked better. But that has to do with the diameter of the aggregate. Okay, um, there's another question coming up. Which is the same in concrete, huh? Yeah. Uh, fiber working in concrete or mortars, it has to do with the diameter. So that's another question obviously coming from a chemist. Um, he asked uh, from the chemical point of view, how can you um, explain why the fibers offer protection against aging? Well, I didn't show you, but I have a very nice graph which shows uh, a surface of uh, a bitumen coated stone. And you see the fibers as a glove underneath the surface of the leather, 
which would be the bitumen, you see a perfect, perfect covering. Nothing new. I, I come from uh, asbestos substitution with synthetic fibers in paint, in concrete, in very thin layers, even in bitumen uh, application outside the road. We see that uh, the initial setting uh, of uh, temperature or setting of the concrete causes shrinkage cracking. This is a service uh, thing. In the Gotthard tunnel, you don't have shrinkage cracking, but on the surface of any um, compound, uh, composite, uh, the initial setting makes micro cracks. And these fibers counteract the, these uh, strains on the surface, which is a very old principle. Even the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the new how to use fibers. Maybe you should go directly to COVID with, with the guy asking so that you can explain a little bit further. So the time has run up. Thanks to all of you. Uh, in the end, I want to thank all of the speakers, of course, for the great contribution. Uh, and thanks, of course, to all of you outside, around Europe and around the world for your questions and your attention. And um, we'll hopefully meet again in person soon. Until then, stay safe, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the Congress. Mantineo Sanos. Goodbye.